Welcome to one of our educational sessions for the Virtual Iowa Port Congress. I'm Colin Johnson of Iowa State University Extension and Outreach, and I'll be your host for the session the evening, this evening. We're glad you've joined us. I look forward to a great discussion tonight uh, on our topic. So as you can see, the 49th Annual Iowa Port Congress is going to look a little bit different this year, and we have uh, had to limit our number of in-person events and move the educational seminars and the Iowa Fork, Fork Foundation auction to a virtual format that you're participating in tonight. So while the shift in events is really kind of a disappointment, the uh, Iowa Pork Producer Association Board of Directors used the core we care principles and values to make decisions to really keep the whole community safer. And as a nation, we've worked through the uh, coronavirus pandemic that's impacting us. So even with these changes, you can still connect with vendors and attend seminars like in the past and support our scholarship program, only this time it's virtually and online. So if you're interested in the other seminars that we have this week in the auction and swine product spotlights or more information about Port Congress activities, uh, log on to iowapork.org uh, for a complete schedule and to register uh, for those events just like you've registered for tonight's seminar. So before we get started, uh, a little bit about our speakers and about our technology that we're using today. Obviously, you've made it this far and gotten logged in, but you're going to be in listen-only mode this evening, which means we've muted, muted your microphones. And chances are you will have some questions for our speakers, and we welcome those questions. Just type those in the Q&A box that will appear at the bottom of your screen or on the side, depending on your layout. And uh, in that Zoom window, do that. And I'll be sure that the speaker takes some time to answer those questions for you. So about our program tonight, as you well know, the challenges and the curveballs that were presented to the swine industry due to COVID-19 and some supply disruptions were plentiful and very difficult. But they're also demonstrated uh, within us a lot of resilience amongst our pork producers and, um, and just fighting through it, we generated a lot of lessons that we're learning that we hope to share tonight uh, so that as we go about to potentially uh, a future concern and issue, we're, we're able to work through it easier. So tonight we have a great panel that will share some of the strategies that were implemented and used during that challenging time and how those strategies can be applied in the event of a foreign animal disease outbreak or another, just call it a supply chain snafu uh, that might occur. So we're going to listen to all three of our speakers and then have plenty of time for your questions and discussion at the end. And a reminder to type your questions in that Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So without further ado this evening, our first presenter is Lucia Hunt, the Acting Director of the Office of Emergency Preparedness and Response at our friends to the North, the Minnesota Department of Agriculture to cover centralized grinding and composting that was used as Minnesota's response to the supply chain disruption. So the screen is yours, Lucia. Potentially. Oh, I think they're gonna play that video. Yep, we're supposed to play the video, it'll be coming. Okay. So we've got a computer lockup uh, within Port Congress. Let's go to Sarah. Sarah, are you able to share yours? Yes, I sure can. So let me uh, let me talk just a little bit about uh, our second panelist. We're going to start with first is Sarah Crawford. She's the Assistant Vice President of Sustainability at National Pork Board. She's going to talk about the trials that were funded by our checkoff dollars and uh, some new methods of depopulation. So welcome, Sarah, and thanks for rolling with the punches. Yeah, of course, thank yeah. you for thank you for having me. And I'm just going to share my screen here. And if you could let me know when you can see that. Excellent. Great, all right, well, Thank you very much for having me uh, here this evening. I really wish I was there in person. I wish we could all be meeting in person. I'm looking forward to when we can do that again in the future. As we know, and was just stated, in 2020, we had great challenges within the industry. <clears throat> and the National Pork Board worked with, within the National Pork Board and with our sister organization, National Pork Producers Council, our state organizations like Iowa Pork Producers Association and our producers and other external entities 
to help res uh, a response, build a response to the COVID-19 pandemic. So today what I'm gonna cover for you is uh, the impact response and looking forward for the National Port Board. So what did we do in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic? And I'm gonna talk a bit about what we did overall, and then I'm gonna cover what we did as uh, in research for depopulation and also then uh, talk about a bit of what we're going to be doing moving forward. And I look forward to taking your questions. So please, as was stated, please put those into the, the question and answer box. And then obviously I'll be around after um, my talk and the other presentations to discuss any questions that you may have. So as we look at the National Pork Board response to COVID-19, throughout 2020, when this really started to show that it was going to be an issue right about this time last year, our staff, so our CEO, Bill Even, and others, and then we have Dr. Heather Fowler on staff, who is our public health veterinarian, started working together to monitor what was going on, what was going on with this new COVID-19 and discussing what should the pork board's response be, even to how do we run our office and how do we keep personnel in the office? Thankfully, the pork board office did not close throughout the pandemic and we were able to help serve our producers. We then saw then, as you would have seen across other, um, uh, other meetings and things, we did have decisions to cancel meetings, travel, and then we reduced the number of staff that were in the office. We created an incident command center. And so this, we realized that, gosh, we really need to focus on this like an incident command. Now, this is not a foreign animal disease, but as we looked at it, we realized a lot of the responses and the way that we needed to work through this were going to be similar as far as how we could operate and making sure that we are, we're working as quickly and efficiently as possible as staff to help serve all of our stakeholders. We had lots of variables to consider. So thinking about public health, thinking about the packing and processing plants and watching those and staying connected. Obviously the farms, we're very concerned about that. Then thinking about our consumers and food service and retail. We saw obviously, and they're still seeing great disruption in food service and retail. And so understanding how that consumer side was going to affect our farms and our packing plants and then obviously how the packing plants and what was happening with public health and with the workers, how that was going to affect our farms in the supply chain. So a lot going on there with the incident command center. We worked closely with various external entities such as uh, the state governments, the United States government, our state pork associations, as I mentioned, the North American Meat Institute, the Centers for Disease Control, uh, Food and Drug Administration, United States Department of Agriculture. So we were really working across uh, a great number of outside entities to really help drive anything that we could do to help our pig farmers. Another item here is that we saw that funding was shifted. And so we had our budget for 2020 and we're on a calendar year budget. So we started strong in January. We'd actually changed to a task force model in 2020 for the National Pork Board. And so we had just started up on those task forces. And when COVID hit, the National Pork Board, the board of directors uh, determined to shift funding so that we could help support the COVID-19 pandemic and especially depopulation and disposal and looking at research methods and how could we help our state pork associations. And so we saw that focus on COVID-19 response. And in January of 2020, the Euthanasia and Depopulation Task Force was created. And this task force was made to um, really to focus on, we were thinking African swine fever and how would we manage depopulation in the face of that? Well, we had already started doing some research, funding research in depopulation when COVID hit and I'll show you, we were able to then fund even more research to help learn. Again, when we first saw COVID-19 coming and going to be an issue, we worked, like I said, collaboratively across the industry 
and made producer outreach items. We had, we created resources for producers, like talking about different feed strategies and preparing if COVID-19 came to the farm. We also held weekly webinars and had a weekly e-newsletter to help our producers understand more about what was happening with this pandemic. Because now we know more, but think back to uh, March timeframe last year and or April, and there were a lot of unknowns. And so we were trying to help through that. As I mentioned, we were able to have a greater amount of funding that was redistributed last year, understanding the severity of what we were seeing in the, you know, for our producers on farm. And so we were able to then fund field trials. So research field trials for depopulation, but also fund We Care grants. And that was through our producer and state engagement team. The depopulation field trials, I'm going to provide more detail in the next slide about exactly what was funded. But the learning from these field trials can then be applied to foreign animal disease or you know, like an African swine fever response or another market disruption like we saw in 2020. We funded seven trials for that. Now that's in addition to the depopulation research that we had already funded and a literature review as well. The state pork association grants were something that each uh, that the states could uh, apply for funding through the National Pork Board to be able to use uh, to respond quickly at a local level to what they felt was needed in their state. So that that was the you know immediate grants and funding for research that we were able to do when we saw this happening. And the great thing about these field trials, you know, a lot of times we think research it takes a while to get through the pipeline. We put out the, we talked about this on a Friday night. We said, gosh, we've really got to help our producers here. We, I wrote the RFP over the weekend. We posted it on Monday. We closed it the next Monday and we funded the projects on Tuesday. We wanted to make sure to get that funding to the folks that needed it. Now this is the field trial research that was, that was funded. And again, this was funded through the Depopulation and Euthanasia Task Force. There were two projects that were funded in electrocution. One was with Dr. Benny Moat, and this was on a V track restrainer. And this project um, used electrocution, but the good thing about this is that no human has to be on the platform applying the electrocution. This is a project actually in a, a um, something that Dr. Temple Grandin had built, and then they made this functional and created this V-track restrainer with electrocution. It works well. They have done this on pigs from as small as about 140 pounds up to large, you know, Duroc boars that are hairy and scruffy that at about 600 pounds. And it works for all of the pigs along that. So that worked well. Carthage Veterinary Services with Dr. Clayton Johnson, um, they did electrocution, but it was with weaned pigs and using an electric um, goad or prod like um, that you would use mainly in small packing plants and used to electrocute the wean pigs from sow farms. It worked very well as well. And they were able to um, do a, a lot of young pigs in a small amount of time. And also it was better for the workers and um, they appreciated being able to do that as opposed to some other methods that might be used for wean pigs. There were two sodium nitrite projects that were completed. One was with Carthage Veterinary Services and with Dr. Aaron Lauer. And this, they were having the pigs, uh, providing them either in feed or water. And they micro encapsulated the um, sodium nitrite because they were trying to get the pigs to eat it better and also tried some flavoring. Uh, they did find some success with that, and but they were looking to make some improvements possibly. Also, Dr. Brett Pepin, Brent Pepin at uh, Pipestone tested sodium nitrite, but on this, they actually used a drench method with pigs and tested sows. This worked at a higher percentage. Um, the pigs died faster and a higher percentage of the pigs died than if you were looking at them free drinking it or free eating it from their feed. Uh, gunshot, Dr. Chad Stahl and Dr. Thomas Fangman did a gunshot project 
And there were some complications because at that time, ammo was difficult to find. But we were able to find some results where um, actually found that using certain types of ammunition that we normally could be using on farm might be too powerful and actually go through the pig and could cause some uh, obviously danger to humans or to pigs if that's being used in the barn or uh, ch chance of ricochet. Now I realize, um, I'm sorry, it shows, it looks like two other projects got cut off uh, of my slide and those were carbon dioxide projects. And one again was with Dr. Brent Pepin at uh, Pipestone and they created a modified trailer for a CO2 and it worked well and they were able to do that. And the last one was with, uh, um, with uh, PIC and they were also testing CO2. All of these research reports are on pork.org slash research, pork.org slash research. And Jamie um, and Colin, let's, let's make sure we can get that information to the folks um, for that. So really good research done. And now what we can do is pass that information onto our producers and also onto the American Veterinary Medical Association so that they can use it in the future. From this information, we created resources for producer, producers like this understanding muzzle energy with the results that we found, we were able to update that with that safety precaution for our producers. We also still have the information at pork.org slash COVID-19 if producers would like to see it. So let's talk about moving forward and looking forward, what are we going to be doing at the National Pork Board? Well, let's uh, thinking about research, what's next for research? So we still need to know more about depopulation and also disposal. Like I said, the, uh, so we're gonna finalize these research reports, make sure they're online. Again, pork.org slash research is where you can find more de detail about what I spoke of. Um, also, we wanna gather any findings and information from the industry for people that actually had to deal with depopulation and work through that, let's make sure we understand what you went through and help us help us help you in the future so that we know. Once we gather that information, we are gonna to create tools for our producers. So we could be hosting webinars for researchers where we can make um, different tools so that people can use these on farm. Um, and then also provide this information to our industry and partners, like we said, like the AVMA, the veterinarians, um, and then next is also focusing on gaps in um, depopulation research that we need to know for, and we'll do that in 2021. So we have this year a new depopulation and euthanasia task force. Stephanie Wisdom at the National Pork Board is leading that. And so now she's going to be focusing on creating those tools for the producers and doing more research on uh, depopulation so that we can help our industry. Um, with that, that's all I have. Again, I will be available for questions once the other presenters are completed. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Sarah. And again, just type your questions in the Q&A and, and we'll address those all after all three presenters have shared. So um, I think we're gonna roll back to uh, Lucia. We had a video of hers we're gonna share. And again, Lucia is the uh, Emergency Preparedness and Response uh, Director at the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, where they did centralized grinding and composting. So we'll try to get hers up. Hello, and thank you to the Iowa Pork Producers for the invitation to join this panel. My name is Lucia Hunt. I'm acting as the director of the Minnesota Department of Agriculture's Office of Emergency Preparedness and Response. Our mission is to respond to agricultural emergencies in Minnesota, and a big part of that is working with the Board of Animal Health on foreign animal disease issues. The office itself supports only three full-time staff, but we have developed an ag-focused incident management team across multiple agencies. Tonight, I'll tell you about the response to COVID-19 and packing plants that put our training to practice last year. After going through the ASF exercise series in 2019, last February, we demonstrated cold weather composting using cull pigs and research pigs challenged with PERS. We studied the composting process, aerosolization of DNA while grinding, the fate of the virus, 
and water quality of the leachate from underneath the piles. We composted treatments using corn stalks, wood chips, and a combination of the two. Temperature graphs show normal heat cycles in all three treatments, so we're confident that winter composting can happen even in Minnesota. But more importantly, the exercise brought together producers and pork industry representatives, the state, and our contractors. We thought we were practicing for an African swine fever outbreak, but little did we know we'd be called into operation so soon. Pork processing plant closures in Minnesota, South Dakota, and Iowa hit our state herd hard and left market weight animals in the barns, taking up valuable floor space needed for younger herds. Minnesota's regulators temporarily eased restrictions on facility capacity, manure handling, and small meat processing. Individual producers got creative and did everything possible to keep their pork in the human food stream. But when all else failed, producers were forced to depopulate their animals to the tune of an estimated 400,000 in Minnesota alone. The Minnesota Ag Incident Management Team was stood up at this time to operate a community composting program. In Minnesota, the Board of Animal Health has jurisdiction over carcass disposal, but we rely on colleagues at the Pollution Control Agency to assist with technical assessments on things like setback distances and reducing pollution potential. To establish our sites, we conducted site visits and evaluated several plots. But it was April and many landowners were reluctant to lose the investment on in inputs already made to choice fields. On May 1st, we signed a land lease agreement on the first site located in Knowles County, just miles north of the Iowa border. Two weeks later, a second site was signed on in Lesseur County. Although we couldn't be sure about the number of pigs being depopulated, we knew we would need many tons of carbon for the composting operation. We asked firms from a wide range of industries to fill out an online form with their business information and then displayed results on the Board of Animal Health website for public use. Executive orders were issued by the governor at this time to waive weight, weight limits and hours of service restrictions for truckers hauling animals and carbon. Our contractors set up site layouts, different for each location based on traffic flow, visibility, and safety. The site on the left had one access point to a state highway, so a loop served to drop spots for both carbon and carcass deliveries. The site on the right in Lesseur County had a private access drive that allowed one-way traffic, keeping most of the heavy equipment up by the road and reducing compaction in the fields. Our contractors rented equipment to do the work based on what we learned from the cold weather exercise. Equipment included a horizontal grinder with 760 horsepower, this is a very big piece, so we had to obtain special MnDOT permits just to haul it over the roads with spring weight restrictions. We had an excavator at each site uh, using a bucket with a thumb. The operator feeds carcasses onto the bed of the grinder and operates the grinder then with a remote control in the cab. We had front end loaders, very important for preparing carbon base layers for compost rows. They also fed carbon onto the bed of the grinder from the opposite side of the excavator and transported the core layer mixture over to the compost beds. Also important, the front end loaders uh, turned and combined the piles as they went through the composting process. We also utilized bobcats on site. This is versatile equipment able to mix carcasses with carbon, feed the grinder, and push carbon piles. Once all of these items were on site, we could start accepting deliveries. But to keep things organized and to avoid accumulations of carcasses on the site, we had producers call a hotline number to schedule their deliveries. They got a time slot and, a, and an approximate number or weight of carcasses to be unloaded. The contractors matched this delivery ticket information to the online schedule and tracked what came into each site. 
Daily communications between the contractors and the operations section of the IMT allowed us to keep track of any problems encountered, site conditions, or weather that impacted operations. Compost pile temperatures were measured by the contractors and monitored by staff composting experts. They used the temperature data collected to track turning. The first heat cycle concluded after approximately four weeks, and at that point, we turned to turning and combining piles for the second heat cycle. Sites were open altogether for about eight weeks when we experienced a rather sudden drop off in demand. The Nobles County site closed on June 30th, while we left the Lesur site open for another couple weeks in case demand picked back up. To determine whether piles were ready for land spreading, we conducted a simple four-hour field maturity test in September. Next, we took samples for basic nutrient analysis to figure out the agronomic rate for spreading. And finally, we analyzed for a comprehensive spectrum of parameters that is used for commercial composting facilities, including tests for a range of 33 PFAS analytes. So we just received results on these at the end of, end of December, so they're still undergoing scrutiny by experts in the field. But some overall notes were that the piles were very dry, nutrients were pretty low overall, Germination tests all look normal, low salt levels were found, and some surprising results from the fecal coliform readings at over 200,000 in at least one pile, but no overall concerns in general for uh, land spreading availability. And now for some lessons learned from the project. Water drainage was a huge problem at the Nobles County site. It seemed that heavy rains always came just as the site had dried out from the previous storm. Windrows were inadvertently placed across the lines of drainage, so we ended up with pooled water and soggy compost piles. This in turn led to complaints from neighbors of strong odors and flies. So after an aerial knockdown spray to control the insects, we moved piles up from the wettest parts of the site and that helped alleviate both nuisances. To add structure to soft soils, we used swamp mats at the unloading area in Lesur County to stabilize end dump trailers that otherwise tipped precariously on the uneven ground. Once the composting process was completely finished, we found that the resulting piles contained too much unused carbon and that some of the carbon was still in very big pieces. The Lesur site happened to be owned by a wood mulch business and the operator tried sifting the piles to remove the biggest chunks of wood, but we were still left with a huge pile of wood chips. One of our industry partners who had also done grinding and composting told us that instead of turning piles for the second heat cycle, they put them through the grinder again to finish composting and make a fine finished product. A final lesson learned was from Nobles County where we had all the drainage problems. The landowner planned to spread the compost in the fall of 2021 and asked that we consolidate all of the finished piles so he could plant around them this spring. The resulting pile was enormous. It was quite wet and ended up drying out over a long period of time. We later learned that this is the recipe for spontaneous combustion in wood chips. The weekend before Christmas, we got reports of smoke coming from a smoldering compost pile. The smoke then turned to flames and we hired an excavator to pull the pile down to find the hot spots. And it turned out that the whole pile was pretty hot. So over the next two weeks, we worked to spread about 10,000 yards of compost to a depth of four to eight inches to extinguish all the hot spots. Thank you so much for your attention. I would look forward to your questions at the end. All right, thank you, Lucia. I'm sure that generated several questions. I see some coming, so. Uh, but before we get to those, we have one more speaker and our final panelist. Uh, while Nick, you get your presentation up and loaded, uh, it's a good friend of mine, Nick Gebler, a professor in animal science department at Iowa State, specializing in 
feed efficiency and nutritional physiology. And Nick's gonna describe how some dietary strategies that were implemented in trials uh, worked to slow growth, uh, impacted uh, growth behavior and carcass uh, composition, and then the analysis of some fresh loin quality as well and, and what those diets did. So take it away, Nick, and wrap us up on presentation tonight. Okay, thanks, Colin. Can you see my screen? We got gotcha. you. All right, perfect. So good evening, everyone. And um, yeah, thank you for the Iowa Pork Producers and uh, Association for inviting me to share um, pretty much a summary of what we started back in March. And that is to do with dietary strategies to really slow growth in pigs. So slow growth diets is pretty much what we did. And so this work was all conducted by the Iowa Pork Industry Center here at Iowa State University. Um, and really a lot of this work started uh, back off some white papers that were written with regard to um, foreign animal disease outbreaks or potential outbreaks. And so those white papers, I think the pork board put one out, Iowa um, State University put one out and numerous other places put, those, put these white papers out, really looked at how can we actually slow growth or slow the pig growth down if we did have some foreign animal disease. So then we took um, some initiatives and started doing this when COVID cases started increasing in the Midwest and then there was potential um, pressure on our packing industry. So before I get started, I just want to acknowledge that this was a team effort from Iowa State, New Fashion Pork and Triumph Foods, and it combined expertise across both nutrition, um, meat science, um, animal production, et cetera, to actually get some of this work done. And particularly Jason Ross and John Patience and Emma Helm were instrumental in getting this work. A lot of the work I'm going to show with regard to growth data. So this was a bit of a um, conundrum for us because typically as nutritionists and production people, we want to maximize lean tissue accretion. We want to maximize growth rates and feed intake in, particularly in our finishing pigs. Um, so really we'll, we'll ask a lot, what are some of the dietary strategies that may slow the growth rates down of pigs? Particularly we focused here at Iowa State on late finishing because at the time there was gonna be pressure on our late finishing pigs that couldn't get into packing plants um, when they were ready to go to market at around that 290, 300 pounds. And then based off a lot of the white papers that were conducted or um, written back in February, there appeared to be little controlled data available to producers to actually help make the best decisions with regard to nu um, nutritional strategies to slow growth down in pigs. And so John Patience, Jason Ross and myself got together and we thought, well, why don't we just try a little, little project and just um, see what we can do to kind of provide some of this data. And so really that project led into some other things and it was kind of fortuitous because about a three weeks after we started the project, then we had the actual lockdowns or at least the shutdowns or, or slowdowns of pl um, packing plants. And then people couldn't move pigs and then everyone wanted to know what to do with regard to dietary strategies. But also as we started this project, everyone was asking us about, well, if we do implement certain dietary strategies, what is the impact on social behaviors of the pig? What is the impact on carcass composition? And so we want to provide data to the industry. So really the overall objective was to evaluate nutritional strategies to slow pig growth rates down, particularly in late finishing, but also to assess if it had any negative consequences on some of these different strategies. So we conducted two studies and I'll present kind of a quick summary of two of those studies um, today or tonight. But really the idea of this was to provide data as fast as we could to the industry for the industry to make decisions in real time of how they would like to actually go about implementing nutritional strategies to slow pigs down. And um, when I say this, we'll literally, my um, Emma Helm and my students and I were weighing pigs the day or that day. And by three o'clock, we had all the data put into the computer for a seven o'clock or 6.30 seminar that um, the Iowa Pork Industry Center was gonna put on. And we we're providing this data as we went along. And so it kind of felt uncomfortable because normally we sit on data and try to process it and understand it, but we understood the importance of just getting data out. So every two weeks, we're putting on a webinar and trying to provide real-time information of what will be the short-term and longer-term strategies 
So what were some of the strategies that we actually implemented? And really, here are the three strategies that we looked into. The first was actually increasing the neutral detergent fiber content of the diets. In other words, just bulking up the diet. Can we get um, fiber above 15, 20%, 25%? And then will that bulking of the diet actually help by reducing appetite and therefore by reducing nutrient and caloric intake and amino acid intake and thus slowing growth down in the pigs? But we knew that we would have to push fiber quite high. But at the time, fiber was actually a hard commodity to come across. Another strategy was to reduce the protein and essential amino acids of the diet. So in other words, what happens if we go for low lysine diet or if we actually look at diets that are going to be low in branch chain amino acids? And then could we create an imbalance in the amino acid profile of the diet to really restrict lean tissue accretion and thus growth in, the, in finishing pigs? Then the third strategy was actually to increase the dietary um, acidogenic salts. In other words, we, we pro primarily we focused on the use of calcium chloride because it is, is being used or was being used in the industry to suppress appetite, especially in some, in some guilt development um, situations. And so we decided, well, let's come up with these three strategies and let's do some sort of titrations with some of these strategies to say, to see what they would actually do with regard to growth rates and behavior and also some meat quality. So to quickly set up in our first study, um, at the time we only had 48, about 48 um, pigs on hand when we actually started this study. Since, um, since the summer, we actually have repeated it because we've got to remember we started this back in probably middle, late March um, that when this work started. And we came up with eight different treatments and, and we had about six pigs. This is now the data on 12 pigs, but we had three levels of pretty much three uh, or four levels of um, neutral detergent fiber. So the control diet was around the 8% neutral detergent fiber. Then we had a 15% NDF diet, a 20% and a 25% NDF diet. And we mainly use soy holes to actually um, increase that fiber content because that was um, one thing that we could get our hands on at the time. The other diet that we use, well, what would be a easy and economical way just to reduce the amino acid content of the diet? And so I came up with the idea um, after speaking with a, a couple of um, nutrition colleagues. I said, well, why don't we just try using straight corn? What if we just grab the control diet, we pull out any soybean meal that would be in, so there'd be no soybean meal in that diet, and then we replace that soybean meal with just corn, just go and pretty much call it a straight corn diet. And so Diet number five that we tried was really a 97% corn diet that, um, that just had some vitamin minerals in it and, and that was pretty much it. And then number six that we tried was actually a um, pretty much a high 89% corn diet, which was about probably half of the soybean meal was taken out to kind of get a, just a two tier level of amino acids. And then really we said, in other words, we had either no soybean meal and reduced synthetic amino acids, or we had reduced synthetic amino acids and reduced soybean meal in those two diets. Then our final strategy that we tried was a 2% and a 4% inclusion rate of anhydrous calcium chloride. So I won't go into too much detail on all this, but really the main thing I'd like you to focus on is going to be the actual, um, is going to be, let me get my pen here is going to be really the two columns in red. And so these pigs all started off at around 150 pounds and we took them up to about 220 pounds. But really, as you can see from this data here that the 97% corn diet and the 4% calcium chloride diet were the most successful at reducing average daily gain over a 28 day period. And we could start seeing these effects as early as the first week. So it didn't take more than a week to really get these results, but we had about a 60% reduction in, um, in growth rates over this 28 day period when we actually used a 97% or a high corn diet. And then the other diet, the 4% calcium chloride diet resulted in about 75% reduction in average daily gain. And that was predominantly driven by just reduced feeding, feed intake. In our individual pens, we had no real influence actually on um, on NDF, increasing NDF actually on reducing feed intake that had an impact on growth rates. 
But really the best way to look at this data is probably looking at the delta body weights or the change in body weights. And you can see from this slide here, the bottom line in red, the solid line in red down the bottom here, over a four week period, these pigs only gained about 10 pounds. This is in kilograms, but really it's about five kilogram, 10 pound gain over this four week period. Where the corn, the 97% corn diet in yellow solid line here actually gained about, uh, this would be about 12, um, sorry, 24 pounds, 30 pounds of weight gain over this four week period. And then everything else was pretty much the same as the control, which, is this, uh, which was the dashed black line up the top. Then also what we did, we thought, well, well, what happens if markets open back up and we just put everything back on a normal control diet with adequate amino acids and adequate, adequate everything. So back on the normal diet. And with that one, we actually, at 28 days, we put for two weeks, we put everything back on the control diet and so wanted to see whether there was any compensatory gain. And really in these individually penned pigs, we see that growth rates in the, in the calcium chloride, 4% calcium chloride pig shoot up in the first week, but really they just parallel what we see with the corn diet. And then also when we put the 97% um, corn diet back on the same feed, they really just parallel the control diet. So really what we saw here with regard to compensatory gain it was there was a little bit of a compensatory gain bump in that first week, but most of that was probably to do with gut fill and water intake, but really we didn't see a lot of compensatory gain compared to the control where growth rates were relatively parallel. In the second study and final study, I'm gonna quickly go through. Uh, we actually published this in the Journal of Animal Science um, this year, that, um, or earlier this year. But um, we, we teamed up with Triumph Foods and, and New Fashion Pork at the, um, back to do this study back in May and June. And then we used 900 late finishing pigs. And this study was to kind of use some of the similar dietary approaches, but everyone was asking us what happens in group pen situations? What happens if you're running around 20, 25 pigs per pen? And so we quickly worked together with New Fashion. They um, provided us a facility where we could use 19 pigs per pen. We had eight pens per diet. And we came up um, with Chad Hasdad and the team up there, we came up with actual six dietary strategies that we chose the ones that were very successful on an individual pen basis, but also we wanted to see whether dietary fiber or NDF would actually be beneficial, more beneficial in a group pen situation. And then we also went with a 3% calcium chloride and hydrous calcium chloride because we thought the 4% may be a little bit too harsh. And then we conducted a 42 day study. Over the first 21 days, of the, test, of the first part of the test period, we actually looked at to see whether there was any negative behaviors that were captured in, in these group pen pigs. And so we looked at tail biting, ear biting, aggression, anemia, lameness. And what we reported in our study with 19 pigs per pen, if these three or for the six diets that we used, we reported no negative behavior in any of the anything that we tested with regard to diet. So even if we had a lysine deficient diet, we didn't see any increased tail biting or aggression. Um, with the calcium chloride, we didn't see any anemia. There was no lameness over this test period that we, we examined. So what was going on? Did we actually slow down growth in group pen situation? And really this um, table here, we started these pigs off at um, pretty much 250, 255 pounds or 125 kilograms. So these were ready to go to market and then we put the brakes on them. So over this 42 day period, you can really see the calcium chloride, this is 3% calcium chloride, did a better job at actually slowing growth rates over this 42 day period than what our 4% calcium chloride did in the individual pen basis. And then we had about a 50% reduction in growth rates with the 97% with the corn. We also had a a tendency for a reduced growth performance over this 42 day period if we actually had a um, low or deficient branch chain amino acid or low loose, um, isoleucine diet. And then we had to really get up above 20% NDF in the diet with, with soy holes to really get a reduction, about a 15% reduction in average daily gain. And then feed efficiency was kind of all over the place, but really the calcium chloride pigs had the poorest feed efficiency.
So how does that look with delta body weights? Just looking at, sorry, at the absolute body weights over time, you can really see it from this illustration here, from this graph, the red line here was the 3% calcium chloride pigs in a group pen situation. And these pigs were pretty much static. We just put the brakes on, on them growing over this 42 day period. And then the corn was somewhere in between the control, which is up the top here. The really, the corn diet, a 97% corn diet and a 3% calcium chloride diet proved to be very effective in actually reducing growth rates. So I didn't have time to really get into the meat quality side of things, but I'll present one or two highlights of that um, in, a, in a minute. But really the general conclusions from this study, we did this work in real time. We didn't have a lot of opportunity to really kind of comb through the data and actually, and actually um, really sift through what was going on. But since then, what we were presenting in real time actually shook out to be something that was actually um, was reproducible and significant, whether it's an individual pen basis or actually in a group pen basis. And really this data that we provided the industry showed that several dietary strategies can be successful in reducing or just holding pig growth for at least anywhere from 14 to 20, for 42 days in a commercial environment or an individual pen environment. And particularly, the use of anhydrous calcium chloride, 97% corn or high corn or low amino acid diet. And even if we have to get um, NDF up 20% um, um, NDF or a high soy hole inclusion rates up there, they were successful strategies that could be implemented. And then this gave really the industry and every, every production system an opportunity to say, hey, just try something different, try something new in your system and you can hold diets. Only the calcium chloride and the 20% NDF diets actually really reduced feed intake. Um, and that was probably part of their strategy of how they actually reduced growth by just reducing feed intake. The corn, there's still plenty of gut fill, plenty of feed intake. And then there's really just a lean tissue accretion kind of mode of action that was happening. Restriction of growth accompanied by changes in fresh pork um, composition and quality, we saw with the calcium chloride diet, a smaller and leaner carcasses and reduced pH and marbling. The 20% NDF diets reduced back fat, there was a lot of color pork, increased drip loss. The corn fed pigs, the 97% corn fed pigs, they had smaller carcasses, they had reduced lean and had slightly increased back fat. For feeding 97% corn, we did not really blow the back fat on, on the pigs. Part of the concern was if you feed pretty much straight corn and high starch, you're really going to favor de novo lipogenesis and really um, kind of blow out corn or blow out the back fat in these pigs. But really, we showed in our hands and in a commercial setting and working with Triumph Foods and Steve and Elizabeth Lonigan here in our meat science department at Iowa State University, we didn't have any major negative impacts with regard to um, fresh pork quality or even carcass composition. There's some slight differences. But if it means we didn't have to euthanize the pig and compost it like the last couple of speakers talked about, the, the producer could still salvage and, and market those pigs. And there was no detrimental on, uh, detriment on pork, or at least on carcass composition and quality. That's a win for us. So to finish up, the biggest take homes are, we saw no negative behaviors due to the diets that we used. There was a big concern about reducing lysine you're going to have increased tail biting, etc. We saw that um, the corn diet or some variation of it appeared to be the most common option selected by producers um, that when they tried to slow pigs down. And then you've got to remember, we did this all in late finishing. There is some other results coming out, um, probably more in, in an early grower phase. And then they did see probably are showing some compensatory gain, but we just did not see that in late finishing. Often producers used, uh, adopted these dietary strategies in combination with elevating barn temperatures to create a little bit of heat stress and also tightening the feeders. And then calcium chloride by far was a popular choice when, it re when you really want to stop growth, but then there's also just availability of the product to actually have enough of it on hand and to utilize it was an issue. So with that, a lot of this information is published on the Iowa Pork Industry Center website. And then I really want to thank um, John Patience, Jason Ross, Laura Griner, Emma Holm, 
and Triumph Foods, et cetera, and all of our partners that really helped us come together to do this. And this research um, was actually just funded by the Iowa Pork Industry Center from their Rapid Research Funds. And so we got this out really quick. So with that, Colin, I'll be happy to take any questions. Yep, yep. thank you. Thank you uh, all three of you for some really great presentations. And now it's your chance as an audience tonight to uh, ask our presenters any of your questions, type those in on the Q&A box. I'm gonna uh, start off with some that uh, have already come through uh, here this evening. And um, let's go, Sarah, you were the first one to, to talk there. One question is how are we gonna use some of this research from the field trials moving forwards? And, and then again, what are some research focus areas for 2021 with that as well? Yeah, great question, thank you. So I uh, didn't have too much time to go into it, but the, the American Veterinary Medical Association, they create the guidelines for depopulation. And they also create the guidelines for euthanasia and for humane slaughter. And so they came out with their depopulation guidelines um, actually not too long before we needed to use them. And so one overall goal is to provide the American Veterinary Medical Association with the data from the research projects that we funded so that they can use those then to amend the guidelines or, or work on those. Um, in addition, the National Pork Board again this year is funding a task force, a depopulation and euthanasia task force, and tools are going to be created for the producers using the information uh, from or from the research. So the data and the information from the research. And finally, uh, we are partnering with the American Association of Swine Veterinarians, AASV, and they have funding through USDA for the National Animal Disease Preparedness Response Project, NADPREP, to also create tools. And we're going to be doing, uh, in collaboration, doing uh, interviews of people that actually experienced depopulation and going through that last year and helping determine what tools and resources need to be created for the producers. And so the research that was completed will again go into that information, also interview the researchers that we funded to help determine what tools are going to be created. So that's um, an idea of some of that. And again, if people have ideas of what tools they want to see on farm, please reach out um, to me, but also to Iowa Pork Producers Association and you know, they can pass it on to us. We'd be happy, We're, we work collaboratively in that way. Um, and then the question about what are some of the uh, areas where we're looking this year? The task force is being created now, but some of what we heard last year when we said, well, what gaps do we see for research? What do you want to see? And we asked producers and we asked the researchers. And some of that is, you know, determining if the pigs are um, unconscious or dead remotely. So if you're using carbon dioxide, how can you determine in that truck uh, if those pigs are unconscious or dead with, because you can't go in until you exhaust um, or if you're using foam, how can we determine that? So that's an example of, of some of the gaps that we'd wanna do. And one last thing um, in answering this question, last year we funded a literature review. So we asked researchers from Ohio State University to go and look at all of the population uh, research that's been done. And they completed that and it's actually published online you can find it on our website, but it's also, it's already been published and it shows, you know, where there could be gaps and where we need more research. And so for instance, before last year, there were no projects that looked at using foam uh, for pigs like is used in poultry, nothing published. And so that's actually something we funded last year. And maybe that's something that'll be funded again this year to be determined by the task force. Thank you. And Sarah, while you're on, what, so in all your observations of some of these depopulation strategies and disposal, what's the best options for producers when it comes to depop? Yeah, yeah, so that's a very common question and one that we received a lot in 2020. And I would say, um, not to be vague, but we're going to need all of the tools and for most farms, they're likely going to need to have a number of depopulation tools available and ready. So when you're making your plan for your farm, 
don't just say, well, we're going to use carbon dioxide and we're good to go. Well, what if there's a shortage or what if um, you're not able to do that? And so in talking with uh, researchers and also producers that had to do depopulation last year, if you can have the setup, if you can make it work, carbon dioxide does work well. Um, it's able to do, you know, all uh, pigs of all sizes, which is helpful. And also um, you can do a number of them at once. And also it's taking them outside of the barn uh, to another location generally. So it's easier for disposal. Um, if, you know, there was also captive bolt tried last year. Um, some of those things like captive bolt and gunshot, again, we need that in the, we need that tool in the tool belt, so to speak, but it's not gonna be uh, necessarily great if you're doing a large number of animals. And um, finally, I'd say these, uh, the research that we saw on electrocution this year. So that's a euthanasia method, but being used for depopulation. And that shows some promise again in, in specific situations. And so I could see on a sow farm though, um, using multiple methods, you know, using CO2, but maybe at the same time using electrocution for the wean pigs um, or something like that. So uh yeah, there's not one perfect method, but it does seem that if people can have access to it in the systems, uh, people definitely thought CO2 was useful. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Lucia had some questions for her online, and, and Lucia, you answered those, but uh, the, uh, the rest of the audience can't see those answers. If you want to uh, expound on some of those questions, or uh, I can read those. And, and yeah, one of those... Yeah, go ahead, Lucia. Oh, um, I got one question about um, kind of the spreading of the compost and what happens to it afterward. Um, uh, the question said it's not as much the concentration of nutrients in the compost, but the way and length of time it will feed the microbiota in soil. And, and this is a really important question and one that we're um, actually just starting to answer. Um, fortunately, our project attracted the attention of one of the researchers at the University of Minnesota, and she applied for a NAD prep award, received that just this year, and so she'll be looking at um, kind of tracking the, the nutrient availability from the compost as it's spread over time. So that'll take a couple of years to, um, to put that all together, but that is, um, that's a great suggestion. Um, and I will add that that was one of the limiting factors for other states that uh, were thinking about starting a disposal program, but were really very unsure, kind of walking into this unknown territory of what they were going to be ending up with. Um, that includes the PFAS level, sort of mysterious um, compounds that show up everywhere. And so that's why we really decided to kind of um, go the whole way and, and really figure out what's in there and what that means for uh, land spreading. However, we did not count on what burned compo compost looks like. So I guess um, we have a new angle to explore on that one. <laughs> um, and then do you want me to look at the other question? Yeah, you had another question there on really what was the producer reaction to the site and, and, and the whole community, I guess, uh, what was their part and play in it? Yeah, we had, well, we compensated the landowners for their, for their land. We kind of asked them if they would give up 20 acres. And so that compensation package was supposed to cover any um, inputs they'd already put on the land, any um, crop loss issues, um, you know, for missed opportunities there, um, kind of a compaction um, reimbursement. And, um, and of course, then they got the compost in the end. So it worked out to be a pretty fair deal for those two landowners. As far as producers go, um, we had, um, I mean, even, even those producers who managed to avoid depopulation on their own farms were very supportive and very grateful for the sites and for the opportunity. Um, we weren't really sure how communities were going to react. It does seem to be, you know, a gruesome method out there in the woods. Um, but, it, you know, we did get a lot. 
we did get a lot of very positive reactions from neighboring communities. Um, I mean, even with the fly and odor problems, they, they were still, they, everybody still understood what this impact was and everybody knows somebody who's a pig farmer in that area of, of the state. Uh, we did get county commissioners to work with us and waive any permits or any local regulations that might be in the way for this. So they helped pave the way to, um, to get these up and running. And we also alerted all of our county sheriffs um, just to let them know where these locations were uh, in case we had any activists, any protesters, um, or any uh, um, other ne'er-do-wells coming to the site. But we were pleasantly surprised that, that they were quite quiet when we weren't there. Yeah, that's awesome to hear. It's great to hear. And, and you said there were about 400,000 potentially euthanized in Minnesota alone. What was the number that went through um, your processes? We took about... Um, we took about almost 20,000, and I'll just say this, car, um, we, we took about 20,000 um, market weight equivalent pigs. Not all the pigs that, we, that came in there were, you know, your standard um, market weight. We, some of the farms took out um, some of their smaller animals. So we just kind of, um, Average that out to about 20,000 market weight hogs. It did turn to be, it was over 6 million pounds total that came to both of the sites. And I will say that we also um, mixed in a, about uh, 20,000 turkeys too. We do have um, a lot of uh, breeder turkeys that were also impacted by the poultry <clears throat> plant closures. So we did take in a lot of those carcasses. Um, so that equals a lot of compost. Yeah. Okay, I've got some questions for Nick. We'll switch to Nick. What, uh, remind us what was the best strategy for slowing growth on those diets? And then as well, um, the fiber sources, what do we use and, and what maybe some other things to consider maybe outside of, of Iowa resources potentially on fiber? Yeah, so by far the best and most repeatable strategy was um, the calcium chloride, using a pretty much a high salt content in the diet. So anywhere from that three to 4% worked really well. Uh, that was by far the, the best, probably the cheapest and most convenient for people to use was the 97% corn or high corn diet. But then, the, um, but there could be some flow issues with some of that corn diet, like bridging up in bins and so forth. So that, um, that was a kind of handling issue. Um, fiber sources outside of Iowa, um, really something, anything that's gonna be high in NDF. Um, or, uh, so really probably some of the wheat mids, um, probably some, uh, even some other, some other holes out of, out of some other grain manufacturing. So really wheat meads are probably the other main one that could be used. Um, the problem is getting enough of it. And so outside of the Midwest, I'm not 100% sure what else would be around. There was distillers, wasn't, there wasn't much distillers around at the time because the, those plants were all down. Um, so therefore there was no, we couldn't get any distillers and then even soy holes was a problem to get. So I think, because then the ruminant industry was was buying up all the fiber sources. But something that could be looked into could be even um, grinding up corn stalks or corn stovers and then using, using or even chaff of some sort um, out of the wheat or oat industry. Um, I think we can be creative if we want to find other sources. <laughs> what about economics? What's the most cost-effective diets? Um, I think the most cost effective was just the probably the 97% corn. I mean, they did eat, they didn't reduce feed intake, but just the cost of input and also it was already on hand. You didn't have to worry about extra transport or actually purchasing large quantities of, of a calcium chloride. But um, that was actually probably the, um, the most cost effective, at least in late finishing. And I think um, 
I think the Iowa Pork Industry Center did do a cost analysis and it's on their website. If, you, if people wanna know exactly what the costs were at that point in time, You know, as we as we put pigs on uh, these diets to slow them down, uh, it creates a bottleneck through the whole system, which was from above at the packing plant level, then to the finishers, and we constantly need to back pigs up or euthanize the smallest pigs. What was the answer? Instead of increasing stocking density, what? Maybe you've given any consideration to this. What do we know anything about potential interactions with stocking density and these diets and some interactions vices per se? Yeah, I think um, I think increasing stocking density in the pens um, could be used because then one you're going to increase um, increase the, um, the heat index or just the body heat. They can't dissipate the heat as well, so therefore that's going to be like a part of it will be a natural kind of heat stress microclimate. You could argue um, so that could also work. But then also there's comp more competition for for feed. But then as you increase the stocking density then you could get into some negative behaviors. And so I think um, in a short term, it could be used, but I probably wouldn't recommend it in a long term because um, it, can, it can lead to some negative behaviors like tail biting, uh, ear biting, et cetera. And also lameness issues can be, can come from increased stocking density. Or at least, I mean, we're talking like really pushing stocking density. And so I, um, I think it's a strategy that can be used in the short term if you just need to hold pigs, but I wouldn't recommend it for a long term. And even just shutting the feeders off and then uh, do, pretty much doing a complete feed restriction or a fasting for multiple days, I would not recommend that as a strategy or even use anything to do with water, like reducing water intake. I would not recommend that either because at the end of the day, you know, we, we've got to take into consideration about all the things we're talking about, there's an animal welfare aspect that we have to have to um, be mindful of. And so I think we need to find the best strategies with the best animal welfare in mind as well. So yeah, there are some strategies that could be good, but it's probably not wise to go down those paths. I think you said that very well. There's one more question, Nick, real briefly, any thoughts on the question is about restricting feed on gestating sows. Now, granted we do that uh, on a production basis anyway, just enough to, to allow for reproductive purposes. But if we need to hold or, or keep open gestating sows, what, how low can we go or what diets would you consider? Um, I know they have used calcium chloride a little bit in gestating sows to reduce um, feed intake naturally. And then um, it all depends on the, on the housing systems that are probably used. To be, depends on the best way you can actually deliver feed if you are going to kind of at least try and feed restrict. Um, so I think diets, the best thing to do is probably going towards more fiber and bulking would be the best approach and most practical approach. Yep. Um, and so going to high, higher fiber up above 20, 20, 20 to 25% NDF, get up there high in fiber would be the probably the best approach to actually really reducing caloric intake in those cells. Agreed. Agreed. Um, I think that pretty well narrows down our uh, Q and A in the in the chat boxes. Anyway, do any of you have any final uh, comments you thought about after your presentations that we need to close with? You know, uh, just one thing that I would remind everybody, uh, and I'd be remiss if I didn't say it. We also need to think about mental health across all of this, whether it's depopulation, disposal, even working in the barns, slowing down those pigs. Uh, and that's another item that I know, you know, our state associations like Iowa Pork Producers Association worked on and National Pork Board's working on. Just please remember mental health resources and um, let's spread those out through our product producer community and help people understand if they need the help with mental health to search for that. And, and so that's something we really focused on with depopulation this year, knowing, or last year, knowing what a challenge can be in those situations. Yeah, very, very good, Sarah. We all need to keep that in mind. So thank you to our panelists for sharing some of those engaging thoughts tonight and to our audience for staying in tune. We've kept you, kept you a little bit long. And again, this is recorded. If, uh, if you have anybody you'd like to share it with in the future, just get onto iowapork.org and, 
and find those seminars again. So, but before we uh, let go tonight, I do want to remind you of the Iowa Pork Foundation scholarship auction, the Dollars for Scholars is happening online right now until tomorrow evening at 8 p.m. Thursday night, 8 p.m. That'll shut off. And the auction funds a lot of scholarships to support future professionals in the pork industry, our students. And uh, last year, the auction funded 23 scholarships. That's great. So help us support our youth through scholarships by supporting this auction. There's a lot of great items, a lot of opportunities for cash donations uh, as well there. And for more information, go to iowapork.org and look for dollars for scholars, or dollars for swine scholars, that is link. And buy one, buy two, buy more items, bid me up. Uh, I appreciate that, doing that. There's no limit. We're not going to uh, not take your dollars, they will make a difference in that uh, in that effort. So I as well just heard before we got on the seminar tonight that some of our staff at, at the Iowa Pork Produce Association, the gals have donated a grilling of pork and the guys on staff are donating some labor. And there's a little competition as to who's going to uh, bring in more money. So get in there, look at, uh, look at what they're offering and, and bid them up. So I'd like to see that to, friendly uh, office fire uh, get going a little bit more. So, but a reminder, register for the other educational seminars we have remaining. And, and you have to register to watch some of those previous ones as well. And the swine product spotlights that we're doing virtually this year, all at iowapork.org on the website. And thank you for joining us for the 49th Iowa Pork Congress, the 50th one next year. I'll see you at face-to-face -face and it'll be a great time. So enjoy your evening. Thank you. <laughs>